Please be warned. Inspired by a true story deals with crimes that may contain adult themes and violence and is intended for a mature audience. November 1986. A young woman, beaten and disheveled, has run from lawn to lawn screaming she's been raped and for anyone to call the police. This hero finds herself ultimately responsible for bringing down two of Australia's most notorious serial killers. In 2016, writer and director Ben Young creates a film frighteningly close to the real story, despite not quite acknowledging it. Prepare for a house of horrors, because Hounds of Love was indeed inspired by a true story. Welcome to True Crime for Cinephiles. This is Inspired by a True Story, a podcast devoted to keeping artists honest. We will discuss the overall details of the actual crimes, then review the film on its own, how much of that is true, and how much is Hollywood magic. I'm Aaron Peterson, an accredited film critic for the Hollywood Outsider podcast and website and devoted true crime follower. And joining me today are my fellow film critics and true crime devotees, John Davenport. Hey, buddy. And once again, filling in for Amanda Sink, who's out for personal reasons, Brian Williams. Hey, glad to be here. Brian, you saw this movie at its debut, did you not, at the South by Southwest Film Festival? I sure did. Yeah, it was something. (laughs) Not quite a joyous experience. It was not the feel-good hit of the summer, for sure. But I I remember you telling me about seeing this uh, when it came out, and I remember you said it was a very dark, harrowing film, but it was quite engrossing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was, I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, as far as the movie itself goes, not knowing anything about the, the subject matter. Mm-hmm. And really, I mean, it, you know how this was, especially then during South by Southwest. They don't give you much information about the movie b- before you sit down to watch it. Right. Two or three sentences briefly for a synopsis, and that's about it. It's just really heavy. And it's one of those movies that you, quote unquote, like, but you may not want to watch more than once. <laughs> so it's such a heavy movie, heavy movie. You need to watch cartoons or, or, or an Adam Sandler movie after this to kind of cleanse your, cleanse your soul a little bit. Yeah. For the, for this one, my wife actually had to go out of the room because, um, she couldn't handle it. The only time she came back is when she heard the dog part from the other room and she came back to see if they were actually killing the dog. And she's like, I hope they just burn. <laughs> I'm like, really? All the horrible things before, you didn't want that quite yet, but the dog, that turned the corner. Absolutely. I guess the reason why I brought up the South by Southwest, so you saw it when it premiered, and Ben Young is the writer and director of this film, and he has been kind of called to task, I guess, if uh, multiple reports where he claims this is based on nine different true crime cases. And I we'll get into it more after the the recollection of actual events, but it sure seems pretty close to this particular story. <laughs> Does it not? Even the victim herself, the the one that we're going to speak to, the hero that I spoke to to in the opening, claims this is this is the same story. Yeah, one hundred percent. It even with some of the minor details. I mean, the ending. There's some things that's a little bit different, mm-hmm. but for the most part, it's you. If you watch any documentary, read any articles about it. You're kind of, and you've seen the movie, you're going, this is that story. (laughs) I don't know how this is an amalgamation of all these other different, nine different stories. So, Did they talk about that, though? Like, they always have a QA and a at South by Southwest. Did it come up at all? Do you recall? I mean, I don't remember that. Yeah, I mean, there was no no pushback at that point, you know. But, hey, I don't remember anything. No, I don't remember anybody calling anybody out on any, anything like that. And John, how did you feel about Hounds of Love before we get into the details? I thought the movie was was great. You can tell that it's kind of shot on this shoestring budget and it's not necessarily a uh, very well polished movie, but with the lack of polish and lack of budget, the, the actors were doing their all to make sure that they were delivering something that was great. 
watching just a movie. The fact that it's a real story puts a different spin on it, of course. But the movie itself, I thought, was a good experience. However, the way we watched it, I would have to say, <laughs> not necessarily the greatest experience. Yeah, we should no. we should mention. And I had seen this uh, a few years ago because uh, Brian recommended this movie from South By. So I had watched it on streaming a few years ago. So I know it used to be in the regular streaming environments. But for whatever reason, it was only, at the time of this recording, <laughs> available through the Redbox app, which... Unless there's, uh, unless you want to log in, sign in, join up for an ad free experience, you have to watch the ad version, and that sucks. I'm just letting you yeah. know. Yeah, it really does. I got like two minutes of Dairy Queen commercials every twenty minutes of the movie, and it was it was rough. And but now I have to explain to any visitors why there's so much Dairy Queen in my fridge. Honestly, can, they have the opposite effect of me. I will never buy whatever I just saw advertised to me <laughs> because they punished me. Yeah, there was. I got, I got a lot of laundry commercials, and it would be a Tide commercial followed by a Downey commercial followed by Gain. It was they followed the like process. Every, yeah, yeah, it was like every brand. It wasn't just like okay, well, all these are owned by the same company. I get it. No, it was just everything was being thrown at me. I got my share of dairy I got my share of Dairy Queen as well. I was going to say it's hysterical. For me it was nothing but Dairy Queen and I you know par- apparently I needed to go out and eat more. You uh you need to, to do I your need, laundry. I've got a lot of laundry to do. Very apparently. stinky. That's what <laughs> they're determining. I don't recall I had a, a variance of a lot of things. All I know is it reminded me how much I hate commercials and i've gotten away from them and we're all spoiled now and i will never go back i will just not watch stuff if it's going to come to that yep yeah i, would I will i will pay you. the extra for no commercials or i will just cancel whatever streaming service and i, it I think it was brian in our group chat uh, correct me if i'm wrong i think it was brian who made made the point that this is a kind of film that is completely ruined by commercials right was it you that yeah said that? yeah because the the tone of the movie is so dark and heavy and intense and, and there's all this anxiety and just pressure. And then it cuts away to these lively laundry commercials or all of a sudden I'm watching somebody eat an ice cream and it does. It does. It, it takes yeah. you out of that moment. It does. It really does. Thankfully the last, I think it was 45 minutes. I no more commercial right. breaks once I got to that point. So I was like, okay, well at least the ending I can focus on. Uh, right. But of course that's my least favorite part of the movie, which I'll talk about after we do the, <laughs> the, the crime. So we should probably get into that. Uh, at, again, as of the recording of this podcast, Hounds of Love is available to stream on the Redbox app, always subject to change. And in the film, Hounds of Love, Vicky Maloney is picked up one night on her way to a party by a seemingly sweet couple out to sell some drugs. And once they get her to their home, she's drugged and then chained to a bed. She then spends several days as their captor where she is brutally abused while she tries to play the husband and wife against each other until everything spirals to a head. Stars Ashley Cummings, Emma Booth, and Stephen Curry. The film was written and directed by Ben Young, and he's, again, the one who's claimed that this was based on nine various true crime cases, though many have stated that uh, this is actually really mostly about the one we're going to talk about right now. But new episodes of Inspired by a True Story released every two weeks. Give me found wherever you listen to podcasts or at thehollywoodoutsider.com. You can hear episodes early by supporting the show at patreon.com slash thehollywoodoutsider. Film and true crime fans alike are always debating how true their true crime is. Please listen to the warning at the beginning of our show because this is a dark one and after it you might need a bath. It's time to look at the details behind The Hounds of Love. David John Burney was born on February 16th, 1951 and was the oldest of five siblings. He grew up in a very chaotic household. It was stated that the family never even ate meals together, and often the children had to fend for themselves. When Bernie was 15, he dropped out of school to train to be a jockey at the Ascot Racecourse, where he was later found to physically abuse the horses. David became addicted to porn, an intense sexual arousal, even once attempting to rape an elderly woman in a boarding house. He was known for both hurting animals and exposing himself. One of David's brothers would later say that if David did not have sex every single night, he would go mad. Once, after a couple of nights of going without, David even asked this younger brother to have sex with him. 
when the teenager declined, he woke up to find David in his bed, trying to have it with him regardless. David married and divorced by his early 30s, producing only one daughter, Tanya. Catherine Margaret Burney was born Catherine Margaret Harrison on May 23, 1951. Her mother, Doreen, died when Catherine was two years old while giving birth to her brother, who then died two days later. A family wrapped in tragedy, Catherine's father, Harold, found himself unable or unwilling to raise Catherine and sent her away to live with her maternal grandparents. But Harold regained custody when she was 10. When she was 12 years old, Catherine met David Burney, and two years later, they began dating. Her father felt David was bad news, so he pleaded with Catherine to stop seeing him. This only strengthened her belief that David was meant for her, and their relationship led to trouble, which found Catherine incarcerated. This jail time gave Catherine a break from David, and when released, her probation officer helped her get a job as a housekeeper for the McLaughlin family. On her 21st birthday, Catherine married Donald McLaughlin, and they had seven children together, though her firstborn son was killed in a car accident as a baby. Fast forward 13 years, and Catherine leaves Donald to head back to David's loving arms. They were destined to be together, it seemed, so she left her children with Donald and moved with David to 3 Morehouse Street in Willoughby, Western Australia, a suburb of Perth. They were never actually married, but Catherine did legally change her name to Bernie despite this. Now to some, this might seem like a tragic love story. Two lovers reunited decades after first finding each other, off to live a life anew. But this isn't that kind of podcast. And this is not that kind of story. On October 6, 1986, this relationship changed. They had tried other ways to find victims. In September 1986, David Burney placed an advertisement in a local paper looking for a roommate that said, urgent, looking for a lonely person, prefer female, 18 to 24 years old, share single room flat. When this didn't work, another opportunity walked into David's job. You see, David was working at a junkyard when 22-year-old psychology student, only a year away from graduating, named Mary Nielsen, showed up looking for some tires for her car. David alluded to some cheaper tires he could sell her and gave her his number. Mary was tight with money, so she could use the brake. So she called David up and headed on over to 3 Morehouse Street on October 6, 1986. When she arrived, the true horror of their plan unfolded. There were no tires. There were no discounts. David and Catherine kidnapped young Mary, gagged her, and then chained her to a bed in another room. David proceeded to rape Mary, all while Catherine watched. They then took Mary to Glen Eagle, where she was sexually assaulted again before being strangled to death with a nylon cord. David having claimed he read in a book somewhere that this would speed up the decomposition process, proceeded to stab Mary's lifeless body, as if everything she had already endured was not horrendous enough. David and Catherine then dug a shallow grave, where they dumped Mary's body and promptly returned home. As if nothing happened. Fifteen-year-old Susanna Candy was next on their list. She was known as a very smart girl, And unfortunately, the day the Bernies picked to troll down the highway was the day Susanna was hitchhiking. And as soon as she entered the car, she was held at knife point while the Bernies tied her hands behind her back. Once she was taken back to their home, she was treated just as Mary was, gagged and chained to a bed. This time, they went a step further and had Susanna write a letter to her father, a renowned surgeon, to assure him that she was safe. She wasn't. David again raped their victim, but this time, Catherine joined in as they assaulted Susanna. They again tried to strangle their victim, 
but Susanna was hysterical, so they forced sleeping pills down her throat. They waited and waited until Susanna fell asleep. Then David made a decision. He demanded that Catherine strangle Susanna to death, this innocent 15-year-old girl. She complied to prove her devotion to David. Catherine later stated that when she did this, she did it, quote, because I wanted to see how strong I was within my inner self. I didn't feel a thing. It was like I expected. I was prepared to follow him to the end of the earth and do anything to see that his desires were satisfied. She was a female. Females hurt and destroy males. Susanna was buried in a shallow grave near Mary's. But they still weren't done. Not by a long shot. On November 1st, 1986, David and Catherine picked up Nolene Patterson, 31. And the same pattern repeated. Only this time, David did not want to murder Nolene immediately after the assaults. So he kept her for three days. Like a pet. This made Catherine increasingly jealous. So much so that she threatened to kill herself if he did not kill her. So David again forced down the sleeping pills and then strangled Nolene. They still were not done. On November 5th, yes, four days after Nolene, they abducted 21-year-old Denise Brown. Unlike the previous victims, Denise was driven to a quiet forest, and David rapes her in their car, then drug her body away from the car in this forest and raped her again before stabbing her in the neck. When burying Denise, they believed she was dead, but she was not. She sat up, likely from shock or terror, to which David then picked up an axe and swung it at Denise's head twice before burying her again. If it wasn't readily apparent, David and Catherine Burney were monsters. Absolute monsters. But the interesting thing about monsters is that, at some point, all monsters find themselves in the presence of a Van Helsing. Someone who can single-handedly bring the whole thing crashing down. And the Burneys met their monster hunter on November 9th, 1986. After accepting a ride from the Burneys, 17-year-old Kate Moore was kidnapped at knife point like the others. They took her clothes and they put them in plastic bags, labeling them with name, age, and address. This time, they forced her victim, Kate, to call her mother and tell her she drank too much and was staying at a friend's house, thinking this would tip her mother off since she was not a drinker. Kate asked David and Catherine if they intended to rape or kill her, to which she was told that, quote, will only rape you if you're good, end quote. David made her dance in front of him to Romeo and Juliet. They chained her to the bed, hands and feet, and proceeded to rape her multiple times, often while Catherine sat in a chair next to the bed watching, and then was forced to take sleeping pills, which Kate put under her tongue until she could slip them under the mattress, and then they slept in their bed. Kate remained handcuffed to David. But Kate didn't sleep. She was planning. Kate woke up to find David leaving for work, and she figured her odds for survival at that point were 50-50, for her own recollection. Kate paid attention. She noticed Catherine laughing and joking about the other girls, and this convinced Kate that they had murdered others and she was next. It was up to Kate to save her own life. Her parents were not coming for her. Kate was smart. She didn't ask questions. Instead, she was waiting, searching for a moment. She wanted to gain Catherine's trust, so she complied with every request, even sat to watch Rambo and Rocky and listen to Dire Straits over her time in captivity. Kate also made sure to leave evidence at every turn she could to ensure that if she died, evidence would show she was one of these missing girls. She hid a lipstick in a beanbag and a pack of cigarettes in a crawl space. Kate said at one point, quote, 
I managed to become friends with her enough that she let me go outside with her and her guard got down. So much so that later, when a knock came to the door and Catherine answered it, she forgot to chain Kate up. That was Kate's opportunity, one she could not afford to pass up. As Catherine was at the door, Kate went to a window and quietly broke the lock. She pushed the window open and quietly crawled out of it. From there, Kate ran from lawn to lawn looking for anyone to call the police until she found someone, a shopkeeper, who would. Help, I've been raped. Please take me inside and call the police. If a woman comes here and says I've had a fight with her and I'm her daughter, don't believe her. I've been raped. Police were skeptical of her story until young constable Laura Hancock concluded she had too much detail, including David Burney's name from a medicine bottle and their address, that this must be the truth. So the police investigated. They took her with to verify that this was the house, which caused Kate to break down. Just imagine going back to the scene of that crime. David and Catherine had vacated the house, but the police got a warrant and smashed down the door, searched the house, found the cigarettes and the lipstick, and the Rocky videotape Kate said she was watching was still in the VCR. Catherine Burning returned with cleaning supplies and then took off, but the police caught up to her. Now, of course, she denied everything. And then David and Catherine were brought in and separated. David acted weak and feeble. He asked to speak to Kathy before going further. The police finally asked David, Come on, how many were there? To which David replied, Four. Catherine refused to speak until she learned David was talking, and then she started throwing David under the bus, claiming he was the horrible one and she was being manipulated. Both of them, monsters. But Catherine took notes. She actually wrote down and recorded the victim's reactions to all the trauma this couple induced. Police believed that Catherine was a puppeteer and David was the puppet. Now, how much you believe this theory is ultimately up to you. There's really no proof either way. David and Catherine did eventually lead the investigators to the grave sites of the bodies, a small, wooded area between a truck stop and a picnic area. And when they arrived, Catherine immediately pointed to where Nolene Patterson was buried and promptly spit on her grave. Like I said, monsters. Both David and Catherine were sentenced to life without parole. The police believed and still believe that David in particular was involved in the deaths of other girls and women, possibly with Catherine involved. Three in particular fit the M.O. Cheryl Renwick, Lisa Mott, and Barbara Weston. But no evidence was ever found that could 100% confirm this. And the Bernies never confirmed these claims. One chance of ever doing so fell away with the death of David Bernie on October 7th in 2005. He was found to have hung himself in his cell. Catherine once told a visitor, I could have stopped that girl. I should have, but it all had to come to an end. Sure, Catherine, that was your intent. Catherine Burney has been in prison since, but Australian law dictated that after 20 years, an inmate gets the opportunity for parole every three years, meaning Kate Warr had to retestify as a sole surviving witness every single time this occurred. Thanks to the inspiration of Kate Warr, who even found support for her efforts from Catherine's son, Peter McLaughlin, legislation was introduced in 2018 that dictated If an inmate was charged with three or more murders, they become ineligible for parole. Due to that introduction, Bernie's parole eligibility was banned for six years. As of this recording, Catherine Bernie remains in prison, where she belongs. David and Catherine Bernie were destined to be together in the absolute worst of ways. These are two people who bring out the most terrible, unimaginable things in each other. Vicious and sadistic, there's nothing here to empathize with. The irony that these hounds of love were brought down by a 17-year-old girl should never be lost on anyone. They believe they can control their victims and dominate 
their bodies and soul. They tortured these women, raped these women, humiliated these women for their own amusement, for their own entertainment. But no matter the point of view, any protagonist has an antagonist in every story. Someone who gets one extra break, one piece of luck, one shining moment to make a move that forever changes the lives of everyone involved. Despite their best efforts to make this story their own, Kate Moir is the hero of the Bernie's sordid tale. She suffered immensely, and yet she persevered not only for her, but for the memories of those young women before her. David and Catherine Burney believed they could capture and control any young woman they chose. And instead, Kate Moir manipulated them, leading to her own eventual escape. A carefully orchestrated choice that led to the imprisonment of two of the worst human beings imaginable. And likely, saved the lives of whomever the Burneys would have chosen next. And for that, Kate, we all thank you. And that's The Hounds of Love, kids. Uh, yeah, Ben Young, I don't think your movie is uh, nine total different cases because there's a whole lot of pieces of all of that wrapped up in that one. Yeah, I don't know why he would say that I, because it doesn't make sense. Unless there's a prolif- prolification of, is that a word? Probably know, not. We could probably start over and make up a real one. <laughs> no, let's just stick with it. Unless there's like some sort of prolific thing that happened in the 80s where several couples were doing this sort of thing on on the regular. I, I don't understand how we can sit there and say this is nine different stories. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, this just there could be small, specific details to where he took inspiration just again to make it more cinematic, inter, cinematically entertaining. I not enough to say. These were all this movie was inspired by all of these other things. This is all of this story. <laughs> it just it just is. Except for the ending, which we'll we'll come back to. Let's talk about this case in particular first. So uh, these people, all of this happened over five weeks. That that's the thing that I find most astonishing. I you stole my stole my thunder with that. No, go <laughs> ahead, man. <laughs> you chime in. Go ahead. You say no, it. no, no. <laughs> Please go ahead. It's just, it's just funny. It just boggles my mind because I remember watching this the first time a couple of years ago and going, well, God, obviously they've been at this for, for so long. And then you look into the story and it's like, wait, they did all this over five weeks? They waited four days from uh, picking up one person to picking up the next person? Like they just, they were losing all self-control, it seems. Yeah, it especially contrasted with the last episode where these all these murders took place over the stretch of two decades. And it was once a, once, you know, once a year or maybe even a little bit longer, but it was this but this is just to be so impulsive and just uh, just terrorizing the that whole area for just, for a little just a little over a month is just mind blowing. Like you can't get that out of your system. You feel those urges again, like literally a couple of days after you've just buried somebody and you, you finally clean up the house. You're like, yeah, let's do that again. I, I can't comprehend that. Well, every story about David feeds that, doesn't it? Pretty much. Yeah. Well, he's a monster for sure. Yeah. He's an absolute monster where he uh, sexually assaults his own brother after his brother's like, uh, no, let's not, let's like not do that. And then he wakes up to it. <laughs> like that's, uh, that speaks to the kind of person David is uh, to a huge measure. But it's, it's interesting to see like how, how weird the, the relationship between Catherine and David is because she seems to appreciate who he is for what he's doing. And it, and she just feeds it uh, fully. I, I feel like, because if you, if you go and look at the dates, like they got back together and very shortly after is when this five week sprint occurred. It was within a year or so. So I do believe that they just happened to be two awful people in their souls and went together 
they feed each other that awfulness. They, they, they both found someone who was willing to support their awful tendencies. And I don't think really either of them is any less culpable or more culpable. I think they're both equally just as awful, no matter who's doing what. A perfect storm of monsters. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect, perfect storm of horrible people coming together. Yeah. 100%. They're just, they, they're just absolutely horrible. You know, it's easy to, to push more of it on, on the man than the woman. Maybe he's psychologically manipulated her over time and all that stuff. But like I said, it's, it was a year or so after they got together to me, they're, you know, they were, they were both damaged well before they started that. And the fact that the two of them found each other, just the odds of that is scary on so many levels. And came back together. I mean, when they got together the first time as kids, they ended up getting into trouble. Like they were obviously just, they get into trouble together. They are awful together. But to them, they probably felt as this was, I finally found a soulmate, someone who would uh, follow me along on this path of depravity. Yeah. In a weird way, golly, to find that person that you could say those things to and, <laughs> and this, here's what I want to do. And for them to go, huh? Ah, yeah. All right. I'm in, you know, that's, isn't that horrible? Because there are, <laughs> man, if they didn't do things, like if they just talked about, like, I have horrible thoughts and here are my horrible, like that is hard to find in that respect, right? Finding right. someone <laughs> right. who you can confide you your darkest just go, thoughts. That's to. interesting. And then just haul ass out the back, you know, out the <laughs> right. back door. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'll be right back. Just I did not mean get, to swipe right. I should have right. swiped left. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't believe this Tinder date. What he said he wanted to do. <laughs> right. But unfortunately, these are horrible people doing horrible things. If this was right. two people that just could confess their sins to each other and actually, you know, have a, a positive relationship, that would be something to look at. That's why I say at the beginning of, of that whole recollection of events, I, it's it could be a love story. I mean, it's it, got all the markings of a of the beginning of a beautiful love story. Yeah, minus him. <laughs> I mean, he, he starts <laughs> really pretty ugly off turn. the bat. <laughs> yeah, the story of him in prison is is weird because he almost immediately ends up being set up in solitary confinement as a way to protect other prisoners from him. And his mental health decline starts pretty much from there. And you know, the kind of things they say about his about what exasperated his mental health to the point of which he committed suicide is like this this phrase caught me off guard. His computer has been confiscated. He's in prison and he has a computer in which they have to actually confiscate? It's Australia. I don't know what their rules are. I'm going to prison in Australia, man. I'm not going to prison. <laughs> yeah. You you have your life goals. I have mine. <laughs> that's, that's not how I want to visit Australia. No. No. I want to actually see some of it. Don't want to be locked up behind closed doors. <laughs> and... and I'm sure he ultimately needed to be protected from them too because of his crimes. He would be seen as uh, definitely threatened because he's the kind of guy that they would go after in prison. He's just a he's a horrible human being, and eventually he succumbed to his own weakness and took his own life. I don't think that's a bad thing. It's a win for humanity, honestly. I think that speaks to just how much control Catherine had over him. What does? Well, the fact that he got to a point where he was able to take his own life, I mean, Catherine, because of that simple fact, Catherine must have been a driving factor in a lot of the murders. Not that he's not capable of it, but she clearly could have a push in that general direction, especially if she wanted to maintain some control about how the, how this relationship was rolling around. I don't understand how the Catherine comes into play when she, he's been in jail for 20 years at that point. Well, I'm I'm just saying because he he was always like this. It's just jail exasperated it. His depression to the point where he he was he was able to kill himself. I think going to jail definitely had a factor. Maybe not having Catherine, maybe it affected him. I don't know. Yeah, maybe he doesn't have the freedom to do whatever he wants to do and get away with it. it had as much to do as Catherine not being there. So. I mean, she might have kept him in, you know, kept him reined in on occasion, but it doesn't really sound like it <laughs> too much. No, it sounds like, in, in fact, she she had him, she encouraged him to embrace his depravity, right? Like yeah. she wanted him to go out there and do these horrible things and she wanted to watch and 
write it down, which is yeah. You don't just gross. take notes if yeah. I have nothing to do with this. Let me grab my notepad and write down all these horrible <laughs> things that I'm watching in front of me. Like it, that's just man. I don't understand some people. Like I understand mental illness, and I understand that people are sometimes inherently evil. But there are levels of evil that I just cannot fathom. I just don't understand. And I try to understand. I truly try. There's there's good people. And if there's really good people on this planet, there's got to be really bad ones. That's fair. That's the best way I can rationalize it. (laughs) Now, Kate Moore, Moore, who escaped, right? This is the one that people should be talking about. Everybody keeps talking about, in terms of this case, David and Catherine, Bernie. A lot of it's about her. Kate is the hero here. Like she, she did what, you know, these other poor women hadn't done. And if she wouldn't have gotten away for sure, more people would have been killed. They were not stopping. They were not trying to stop at any time. And the fact that she made this break, that she played these people as much as she could, that she went along with them, that she complied, that she was not fighting so much as trying to garner trust so she could get out. I think that, takes a very strong person to pull off. And at 17 years old, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. To, trying to at least trying to find cracks and crevices in between them two and try to manipulate them to where she might be able to get a little opening to where she could, she could escape haul ass, whatever is just, it's amazing that she had the strength really to, in the focus to say, you know what? I'm not going to take these drugs. I'm going to, I'm going to fake it. And then while they sleep, I'm going to plot my way out of here, that kind of stuff. So yeah, she's absolutely the hero of this. Yeah. I I get upset when you think about what happened with the police. She shows up police station. She's like, Hey, this happened to me. It really did happen. And they give it to the most junior detective that they possibly can, or the most junior officer they possibly can, uh, because they don't believe her. And if it wasn't for the fact that Kate did such a good job of telling the story over and over and over again and pointing out all the simple facts, this officer finally said, oh, maybe there is something here. Like, it's so sad. Yeah. When they investigated, the fact that she pre-planned and she planted evidence essentially to make sure that people knew that she was there. That's brilliant. Like, I'll be honest, man. I've been in some hairy situations. I don't know if I would have forethought (laughs) that much. I would have been like, how do I get out? How do I get out? How do I get out? Instead, she's, I'm going to put evidence. You're going to know I was here. Everyone is going to know I was here at some point because she's already kind of, I'm going to try and escape, but I don't think I'm going to. So I'm going to put evidence here so people know I was here eventually because it's going to happen at some point. Extremely commendable. Very impressive. Then moving on to the movie, as a standalone film, not a real knowledge of the case. I mean, what did you guys think? I mean, uh, Brian, you saw it when it premiered. John, you just, I think this is the first time you saw it. I mean, you already said you enjoyed it as a film, but were you shocked to learn any of the details of the actual true case after the fact? Like that this, so much of this was actually true? When you watch a inspired by true events based on a real story, Mm -hmm. whatever, however you want to say it, you, you kind of know that it's, it's altered in some, some capacity, but to see how much of this was pretty much spot on (laughs) was kind of, it was kind of jarring and yeah, the details kind of like, you know, and to, and to learn some of the details, like again, the time frame is what just keeps sticking out to me as far as the, just how quickly they just did all this stuff is just mind blowing. So, but yeah, I mean, the, again, yeah, the film itself was, I enjoyed it and the, uh, or it no, was, no, you don't want to say you enjoyed it. I don't want to say it, enjoying it's Yeah. It, it was, yeah. The way it was shot, though, was the, the all the slow motion stuff, especially the opening scenes where it's all this slow motion and you kind of really feel that how stalking this couple is. It's a quality movie. It's just not one you want to watch very often. <laughs> or ever again. Yeah. Or ever <laughs> yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with that fully. It is a quality movie. It is well thought out and they use every bit of the characters, the budget and the film and any, any sort of like, what could we do on the cheap film know-how to make this an experience on the screen? And the performances I think are profound. I, I really do think like across the board, all three of these. And, and I think Stephen Curry, isn't he known like as a comedic actor? 
yeah, he's he's I don't want to say like Jim Carrey, but he's kind of at that level. It's he's known for his comedies. So to see him playing such a dark role is is a huge is a huge twist for a lot of people. That's that's wild. All of them are good. I I, I found uh, Emma Booth to be quite endearing. She's you know the girlfriend or wife slash whatever you want to call it. John and Evelyn White and um, Ashley Cummings was I thought phenomenal. Uh, you know even though a lot of her role is consists of screaming and yelling and just looking pained because she's in utter horror. But I did, I did like that the rape scenes aren't overly graphic. It's more of alluded to as opposed to shown, which I think is always important. I love the scene where she shits the bed, by the way. I think that was, God, that was, that was a great F you to him from her. And I thought that was great. <laughs> I can't do much, but, but, but I can right. do this. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to the, However true it is to the events or how much of this is based on those crimes versus the eight other ones that apparently he's pulling out of the ether, director Ben Ben Young, I will say I don't like the fact that they tried to make, tried to make Emma Booth's character of Evelyn White relatable or empathetic in some way. I don't like that at all. I don't. Um, and I don't like the ending. The ending was um, is a maddening portion of the film for me. The reason being is it, you just heard the whole true story, right? I went through that whole true story and how brave Kate was to get out of there and do all those things. And you can tell me all day that this isn't taken from the same context, but she even went out a freaking window. Come on. <laughs> and went running down the, the street screaming, except this time her mom was there. Okay. Well, that one, that's contrived. That whole thing is very contrived and it feels very formulaic and almost generic in many respects. The actual facts are so much more engrossing. Follow that. Show this woman action. Cause at the end, she actually doesn't cause her own escape. She gets lucky. She gets lucky because this woman who somehow has been, she's manipulated so much to stabbing this guy that she's done all of these horrible things with. That's what gives her the opportunity to leave. And twice she has the opportunity to stop her and chooses not to. I just don't like that you're basically giving this character a, a somewhat of a path to redemption. I don't like that the wife gets a path to redemption. And I don't like that the young girl doesn't escape on her own accord. She deserved it. I, th- I think that character deserved to escape on her own. Do those things make sense to you or am I overthinking it? Well, I, I can't agree with you more because of everything you just said. It's just it does. It robs agency. It robs her of her agency, uh, robs her of the the fact that she had she has developed this path to her freedom the way she did through the story. It's unfair to the character and it's unfair to the actual victim. I mean, the only thing I could think of as to why they did it this way is because you almost have a whole nother story to explain when it comes to Vicky going to the cops and the cops not not believing her. Like they sort of hinted to that in the movie, but they didn't really nail nail it as hard as the they mother. could have. They went through the mother instead, right? They went through right. The they went through the mother instead, which I think that's a, a it was a bit of a cop out to me. There's that that tense moment of the car driving by there's the, you know, you, is she going to see that close? How you, you know, and that whole scene is what, 10, 15 minutes or something like that. And it's all of this mom screaming up and down the, the street, you know, this, is she going to see her? Is she going to hear, is she, is she going to die? All this other stuff. And she finally gets out and mom just happens to look up in the rear view mirror and see her standing in the street. Then, you know, of course, my <laughs> a-hole brain goes, why are you running two blocks down the road? Why didn't you just put that car in reverse and haul ass backwards? But Man, whatever. I said the same thing. I'm like, why are you getting out of the car and running back to her? You right. have a car. And not to mention, mom runs and brother, I guess. Yeah, and, and they're just and not dad's moving. boyfriend. Boyfriend yeah. and dad. Okay, thought, boyfriend no, was, and dad just sit yeah, there. Yeah, boyfriend and dad, yeah. They just yeah. sit there looking dumbfounded, like, is like what where, is "What's going on? Where is she going now?" So, yeah, I I didn't like that. Then it, it's like they hug and boom, it's over. And I'm like, "Wait a minute! I sat here for almost two hours of all this heavy stuff. Give me something to feel good about." The and it does. I mean, hey, she gets out. Okay, you know. I mean, I don't need to see court cases and all that stuff. I don't need to see all yeah. that. But I I would have liked another 
I don't know, five minutes worth of <laughs> of her resolution? showing some lesson she learned or some or, or, or that her yeah, mother I learned mean, or that just dad learned. There, yeah, or maybe you know because her and her mother had such a contentious. Or I guess we're making up words all the time. Yeah, I see, it's fun, isn't it? it you just contentious. Had <laughs> and uh, <laughs> John's contagious, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> stick with me, kid. I'll show you the way. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, they set all that up where they're they've, they're they're butting heads a lot, and it would just kind of maybe be nice, other than the hug, to say maybe there's a quiet night of them sitting in her. Her house, which isn't as good as dad's, it's mm-hmm. not as fancy as what dad's got going on, and she's not buying her puppies, and she's doing what she can. You know, they're just, it's a quiet night inside. Maybe, no, they're not even talking. Maybe they're both reading or something like that, watching TV, whatever the case is. Just something that's like, okay, they're going to be all right. I just don't think, they, and I, you get that from the hug, but then it just stops, and I'm like, I need more positivity after all of this other mm-hmm. horrible stuff. Well, you didn't get that from the Downey commercials. Speaking of the commercials, <laughs> uh, I right. think that's why this was two hours long was all the damn commercials because yeah. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure there's a much shorter movie, but the commercials were what lengthened it out to be a, an entire night of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was, a, it was excessive. Like, I really think this could be a great film in terms of engrossing right you don't want to say like the the events are great they're horrible but yeah i needed more at the end and i for me it wasn't so much that i mean although i think that that would be important to see that their relationship was mended in some way other than a hug i think that was kind of a cheap way to do it it's just the whole movie is is this girl going to get out of here is she going to find a way out of here and she just gets lucky and i just don't like that it's almost it's like when Bond gets caught by a villain and goes to the exposition and then forgets to push the button so Bond can escape. Like, it's just, <laughs> that's not what should have happened here. I mean, you've got a better story by this from the actual events that you didn't copy. You know what I mean? Like, so go take those. They could have made so much better use of, of screen time by by adjusting that that unnecessary parents were divorced storyline. Uh, they they don't they didn't need it they didn't well, they needed really it to add. fuel what happened i mean it, it, well they could have done it yeah. any yeah. other way they could have done it just by a simple mom and dad are at the table hey you can't go to that party poof i'm jumping out the window to go to a party anyways like there you go that's as that's as good as it needs to be you don't need that whole subplot because the story isn't about this girl and her relationship with her parents the story is about the girl and her strength and ability to escape these monsters yeah but it it also sets up the fact that she's not happy at her mother's house. And so she's going to go <laughs> funny enough. What, jumping out of a window is what gets her into this problem. And also what gets her out of this problem. Oh, <gasps> hey, hey. What? Boom. Mind blown. Wish I would have known that when I wrote the damn review <laughs> eight years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Took a while to get there, but right. it got there. <laughs> it <did>. but I got there. <laughs> Okay, one more thing I got to come back to in regards to the movie. So Ben Young again is it said oh, this is covering like nine stories, whatever. And Kate Moore is kind of unhappy that he won't just acknowledge it, or at least was when the film released. Like said in interviews, like this is obviously the story. So why aren't you acknowledging it? I just got to say, so I mean, you can say it's from a bunch of different stories, but this is basically at least five of them are from the victims in regards to this story is what I would say, because you just look at the things that are connected to the original case, right? Sleeping pills, um, chaining them to the bed, the rapes, burying them in the shallow graves in the middle of the forest. You know, you, you just, you can just keep going and going the whole relationship between the two of them, the manip- the horribleness, the fact that she watches and participates in the rapes as well. The wife, him going to work and coming back and, forcing her to to commingle with them etc i mean just like on and on and on. The, the whole going to the police and they don't believe her but they just put it through the eyes of the mother you know those kinds of things like getting out the window to escape at the end all of these things are very much from this case and i just got to say it one more time it's the same freaking case like <laughs> ah <laughs> drives me nuts Usa. all right that's out <laughs> I've got, I've got nothing else on that. Um, (laughs) So what the movie got right and, and did it respect the victims? Do you think this respected the victims? 
again, I would say I don't think the victims have much of a voice here, and they don't really give the character of Vicky true agency, as John said. And that's uh, that also means they don't really give Kate any agency for what she accomplished. And the rest of the victims are just, just a foot footnote. They're yeah. not even. It's not really part of this even story. So right. What would you guys have done differently? Anything? I honestly, I think I just would have given a little bit more of a some sugar at the end of that. <laughs> because <laughs> it's such a that. dark and dour story. It, it, like it just, is, yeah. and it's so heavy, and it's so dark, and it's for so long. To just stop, it just leaves you going, "What the hell did I just do?" Yeah, I'm. I'll go. I watch a movie to be entertained, and this again, this was entertaining for the most part. And it's not a. I don't think it's a horrible ending. I just wanted it to be a end on a on a little bit more positive note, or give me a little bit more of the positivity. I should say, because they were already going that route anyway. Yeah. Like if it ended, I, I will be honest, if it if the movie intended to end with she doesn't escape and she just loses, if that's the movie, that's the movie. That's what I'll judge it on. I'm not saying change your movie to a hopeful note, but if you're already leaning that way, give us that extra step, right? Right. Right. I would have adjusted the parent subplot to what I've described where it's not as not as underlined with this strife as it seems to be uh that doesn't really ever com- come to an, a head or a point um and i would give her return her agency to her as far as keeping it more honest to the story and i would have ended the movie by saying okay so she gets away she's walking in the police station and you got the desk sergeant there or whatever that is called there or desk constable. constable who gives a shit the desk constable looks at her in this this bloody disheveled state and just has this annoyed look on his face and then black it's over well god that's kind of a dickish ending like you just, yeah you want them to not believe her then or to imply that he's not going to believe her yeah i want them to imply i wanted i wanted to stick closer to closer to the real life so that when so that when people watch this they are like oh right maybe, we need to start maybe believing that's the not victims. one of the parts maybe that's from one of the other uh inspirations from one of the other eight resources that Ben Young used. <laughs> right. So. Right. You know, I, I but I want to I want to see I want to see the the police being held to the fire a little bit more in their not believing the victims. I want to see more of this mirror sent back to them of what they're actually doing when somebody is coming to them and they don't believe them uh, right off the jump. I can respect that. Well, you're looking at that through 2024 20, lenses, though, for something that happened 40 years ago or 35 years ago or so. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, we've but it's just though. the way it was. Yeah, we've we've evolved since then. We do listen to those people who have been marginalized for years and decades. and But at the time, you've got somebody who's, who's I don't know, they're just, there's certain people, unless you were a grown man for the most part you weren't really taken seriously and that's a horrible thing but that's kind of the way it was and i don't know i I wouldn't i wouldn't want to see that as a two-hour shame on the police movie no and i'm not saying it's a two-hour shame on the police movie but it's at least a, a a point to remember it's a it's a it's a final point of what what if we're going to make a story that's based off a true story we're obviously creating something that number one it's going to entertain number two it's going to inform and number three it's going to serve as a mirror to whomever is watching it to make sure that they can adjust themselves for the future like that's that's the whole purpose of using history to create a story like this at least to me and so if you're not going to occasionally remind people hey this is why we believe victims hey this is why we do this if you don't occasionally remind those people we start slipping back into oh well i mean she has an only fans account what did she expect to happen to her oh well she was out at a party wearing a skirt like what do we expect to happen to her of course she's going to get abducted by a couple of crazy people you know that these are all things that are unfair of us to say but you know at this even at this day and age we still say things like that when it comes to certain people you know she was wearing skimpy shorts and a, a, and a tight top of course this happened it's 2024 and we're still saying things like this so we need to be reminded occasionally and have that window uh that mirror held to our face to say this is exactly why we believe people we need to believe people or at least give a give 
give them the opportunity to either be lying to us or figure out the truth. But this is why we need to do that. We can't always say that every single person is lying to us because it ruins, it ruins the whole view for everybody. Stop hanging out with people that say things like that. Number one, jeez. Everybody's a douchebag until you prove me otherwise. That's the way I roll. <laughs> See? That's exactly my point. So I pulled up the address for where this, this house, because we were talking earlier, you sent it, some information about the house that was this hall happened in was, on, was for sale a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Close to a half a million or something, yeah. The market's gone up because a couple of houses, <laughs> not that house, but a couple of houses on that street, maybe a block over or like, 50% higher than what that listing was at the time. So yeah. they're even more. I mean, it was, it was 35 years ago. So things have been built up, I'm sure. Sure. Uh, and apparently it is kind of a desired area. But yeah, I mean, I just, I pulled up the house and it's a, I mean, it just looks like every other house, but all these houses are so close together. It just, it's kind of, it's that really is, kind of amazing. Yeah, I'm looking that, at it too. It's, that is mind boggling detected anything nobody heard anything saw anything out of the ordinary what have you but i mean people do mind their own business and, and stuff but but it sits basically at the end of the street where the street makes a kind of a 90 degree turn and yeah there's i mean there's half a dozen houses within a you know stone's throw of it just right around it so it's you could touch the back that the next house outside <laughs> a window you can touch it right and does it look like similar to the house in the movie? It looks, yeah, it's similar. It's a similar look, but that's that's kind of similar with Australian architecture, especially out yeah. Western Australia. All right, Ben Young, you're getting out there. <laughs> that's an. I just can't believe that house would go for you know a half million or whatever. I'm like, it's a murder house. Who wants to live there? <laughs> Who is okay with, ah, that happened 35 years. It still happened. I don't want to be, uh-uh. It has still had a soiled mattress in one of the rooms that I'm forever going to think that room has a soiled mattress in it. Or the ghost of one. <laughs> <laughs> the ghost of a soiled mattress? <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. So if you enjoyed this podcast, share the show on your social media outlets and uh, give us a review on your favorite podcast app. Of course, you are the best source of promotion. So tell your friends about this show, Inspired by a true story and thank you for listening now let's keep those artists honest